Good evening, and thank you for joining me. Tonight's message I've entitled, The Search for the King. You know, this past Sunday, we took the steps of the Magi and search for Christ and search for the King. Tonight, let's explore this topic some more, and I'll be going through uh, several passages in the Bible. We'll be looking here uh, for the King. And so let's look at that topic some more tonight. In the book of Revelation, one of Jesus' titles is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Jesus had stated on many occasions that he had received authority from his father. You know, authority belongs to God. He can give it to whomever he wishes. Authority belongs to God. In the book of Daniel, we are told that it is God who establishes and removes kings. Daniel chapter 2, verse 20 and 21 says, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. In the book of Jeremiah, we read, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. It is God's work to establish the king, to raise him up. And the king whom God establishes will be from the lineage of King David. Hence why the Gospel of Matthew begins with a genealogy. The Gospel of Matthew begins with these words. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son of David. Both the title Christ and Messiah means Anointed One. God establishes and raises up the King. The King we see is from David's lineage. David's lineage. This is where the King is from. The, the line of David. And this is what we find the angel of the Lord uh, telling Joseph in a dream. The angel says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit, from God, the anointed one. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, the Lord saves, because he will save his people from their sins. God raises up and establishes the king. The king is from David's lineage. He is a righteous branch. The house of David was told, was given a prophecy. The Lord said, Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or the highest heights. But Ahaz, the tenth descendant in the lineage of David, refused, saying, I will not ask, I will not put the Lord to the test. To which the prophet Isaiah speaks and says, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. 
Here's a sign that was given, prophesied, and now fulfilled, as the Gospel of Matthew declares. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Here we see a righteous branch. God establishes and raises up the king. The king is from David's lineage, and a sign is given to mark the birth. It's a miracle, a sign from God, a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. The Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, Emmanuel, God is with us. God's plan to raise up and establish his king will prevail. As we read in Psalms chapter 2, why do the nations conspire? Why do the nations rage? and the people's plot in vain. The kings of the earth rise up, and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. He, the Lord, scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Here we see the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the Lord's anointed, and he will prevail, for it is God's will. It is God's plan. Emmanuel, God is with us. As we read in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 10, Devise your strategy, but it will be thwarted. Propose your plan, but it will not stand, for God is with us. Emmanuel, if God is with us, if God is for us, who can be against us? God is with us. Emmanuel. We take the steps of the wise men to see the birth of the king, God's anointed, the ruler of the kings of the earth, given authority and established by God, a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right. A sign given. A miraculous birth. As it says in Isaiah, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. We read about the superiority of the Son in the book of Hebrews. About the Son, God says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. 
A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. See, the Israelites had expectations of a conquering king. Some Orthodox Jews still have a similar view of one to come. Israel had a longing for great leadership. Much as the United States government recognizes three branches of government, Israel had three important kind of leaders, prophets, priests, and kings. Prophets told the truth, revealing God's righteousness. Kings, as head of the government, were to put righteousness into effect. And priests were to see that God met his people in worship. They represented God to the people and the people to God. According to the God-given Israelite constitution, kings and priests always came from different tribes. A priest from the family of Levi and a king from the family of Judah. Ordinarily, a king could not be a priest. The Messiah, however, must be a total leader, a perfect king governing justly, a perfect prophet revealing God's truth, and a perfect priest bringing God and people together. But how could he be all three when priests and kings were supposed to come from different families? Wouldn't that violate God's law? Psalms chapter 110, Psalms 110 suggests, and Hebrews 7 amplifies the answer. We have already established the Messiah's king's kingly lineage through the line of David. In regard to the priesthood, he is designated by God to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. You see, Melchizedek was king and priest. Melchizedek's example proves that a priest need not necessarily come from the proper family. Melchizedek was not even an Israelite, let alone from the Levite family. He knew nothing about the temple or the Old Testament law, for these came after his time. Yet his spiritual power impressed Abraham. Melchizedek show, showed the kind of leadership Christ was to bring. He was both priest and a king. The Messiah, while David's descendant, would be greater than David. And by tracing the Messiah's roots to Melchizedek, it established his credibility as both priest and king. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 24, tells us that because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, if he is able to save completely forever those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. He's able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our need. One who is holy blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Well, I thank you for taking these steps with me tonight. 
looking more deeply into who Christ is, who he is as king, and who he is, we see here, as priest. Thanks for taking the steps with me as the Magi did to get a little bit closer to Christ. And I hope that this message will do for us like it did for the Magi, that when we see, we will bow down and worship. I hope that this message has been a blessing to you, and I hope and pray that you have a blessed rest of your week. And until next time, bye-bye.